Hey everybody, I'm really excited today on Expat Kingdom. I'm here with Mary Ann uh, Dorward, and I'm really excited to be speaking to her today because uh, she's actually currently living in Crucita, Ecuador. She's been there about a year now, and I think she's got a lot to bring to the table for the audience. So I'm just uh, wanted to take a moment to say thank you. I'm so excited to be speaking to you today. And oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, hopefully, I got your last name pronunciation correct. You're good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. It's always a little nerve wracking. You never know if you get it right. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, you're doing great so far. Okay. Good. So, um, so basically, since you've been in Crucita now for a year, that kind of is probably giving you enough opportunity to get a feel for for what it's like down there. Um, but I'm really interested to find out what is what has inspired you, or what did inspire you to actually move abroad. Well, there were a lot of reasons, actually, that all came into play at the same time. Freedom is certainly one of them, the ability to do what I wanted uh, that I could do in another country. I always had a dream of living in another country, and I really wanted to see what that would be like. And so that was one aspect of having the freedom to do that. Um, another aspect is that I had been very sick in the United States and I was looking for a place where there was a better quality of life, uh, less stress, um, more, uh, let, no GMO food, uh, air quality, sunlight, all those great things that help uh, you feel physically vibrant. And uh, I, I did find that here in Ecuador. Um, and then I guess I had the opportunity to see what it would be like just to be on the coast. I'd always had this dream since I was a little kid uh, about what it would be like to live right on the ocean and uh, I was able to do that here in Ecuador in a way that I probably would not have been able to do in the United States. So sure. there were a lot of reasons and certainly I have found that the Ecuadorian community has been very warm and very welcoming especially because I speak Spanish. We we're able to communicate and I have found them to be an incredibly gracious and generous and just a lovely, warm uh, culture of people. And so I, they, I felt very welcome here, and uh, that's been great for me. That's exciting. So let me ask then, because you mentioned that in the States, you really never had the opportunity to live on the coast. And uh, that's actually something that I aspire to do as well. I'd love to be able to live on the coast. I just naturally feel... Like life is at a better pace. It's uh, a lot more enjoyable. There's just more to enjoy and and I guess experience when you live close to the coast. So, uh, with that being said, where where did you live in the states? Well, I lived in Port Townsend. Actually, was the last place I was living. I'd lived in Seattle for 20 years, and I had moved to Port Townsend for about a year, year and a half before uh, we came. My husband and I came to Ecuador. And uh, that was a different kind of coast line because it was always gray. Nine months out of the year, it was raining, foggy. You know, you were lucky to get a, a few days of sun here and there, but mm -hmm. that was really weighing on me. I, I really didn't like the darkness. Um, yeah. Also, uh, it's, it's well, here's a, here's a kind of interesting contrast. Certainly in Port Townsend, being in the Pacific Northwest, in the middle of the winter, it was like about now, it was getting dark at four, and then it was getting light at eight, and so there was like this eight hours of, I gotta get outside, you know, but then it was <laughs> wet and it was dark. So the idea of living on the equator, where it's six hours of sunlight, six hours of darkness, you can really bank on it. The only thing that happens on the coast is you watch the sun move from here to there. Yeah. And uh, so living on the coast, that I imagined myself doing was in a nice sunny place, nice and warm, you know. And Port Townsend, as much as I loved the people there and I loved the quaintness of the town, a lot of really interesting, musical, artistic, sure. creative people there, um, it was just the weather that yeah. it wasn't the coast I was looking for. So what's great about Crucita is it's in this little sun hole. It, 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 it can be cloudy north of here and it can be cloudy south of here, but Somehow we're in this microclimate here where it's pretty much sunny and a nice breeze all around and we can drive north or south and find that the weather can be completely changed. Um, 
there's different aspects of living on the coast, certainly here in Ecuador. I mean, we really didn't like Salinas because it was too much reminiscent of Miami. Sure. And, you know, I, as much as it was a beautiful uh, town, it was just high rise, high rise, high rise. And this is much more of a quaint rural fishing village. Mm -hmm. So we get to know the people. We have our regular fishermen that we go to to get our fish every week. We go to the market and we go to our regular person who gives us the vegetables. We got our Criollo, our uh, eggs that, that are from uh, natural chickens yep. that are organic chickens. Yep. Yep. Um, we got our organic chicken this morning at the market and they we have a standing order with them for five pounds of chicken a week. And so there, there, this kind of coastal zone is much more rural. So as far as Crucita, what are the, some of the nuances as far as living there? You, you know, you actually mentioned something that I found extremely interesting. You were talking about the non-GMOs, uh, the food and stuff like that. So can you tell me a little bit about that and if, if Crucita has actually met your expectations regarding that? Oh, yeah. Definitely, Lane. Um, I would say that what's really interesting about living in a small coastal fishing village is, first of all, you have access to fresh fish, which come in the night before. And we have a relationship with Gabrielle about a block away. And every day he has the fish that we like because now we've bought for an entire year. He says, oh, I've got the fish you love. And so it came in last night or <laughs> we got some great bonita tuna last night or, hey, you want some shark? You know, um, you want to try something new. So there's that. And, of course, there's no radiation coming uh, south of the equator from Fukushima. So we have fresh fish that's not irradiated. So I feel comfortable eating the fish. Really? We looked for a long time. Um, we found out that the supermarket chickens were shot full of hormones because they were turning them over really fast. And they were two and three weeks, maybe even a month turnover between one chicken and the next. And so we were on the hunt for non-GMO, non-hormone, what we call here Criollo chicken. Mm -hmm. And that is a different fed natural chicken. So finally, uh, well, we had been going to the market north of here, and we had already found our favorite person who uh, we bought vegetables from, and none of them have hormones, and they specifically know now that we like the broccoli we like and the cauliflower and the various other things that we, we eat every week, and you just become creative taking the same ingredients and putting them yeah, together sure. different ways. Right. But in this case, all of the vegetables are, are organic. So all of the fruits that we buy are organic. And then um, we had been looking for a source for organic chicken. And first we found a source for organic chicken eggs. But of course, they needed the eggs to lay, they needed the chickens to lay the eggs. Right. <laughs> so they weren't going to go kill the chickens for our benefit. So. First, we started buying the chicken eggs, the Criollo chicken eggs, which are harder, harder to find here. It's much easier to find the hormone-based eggs. Um, so then we kept asking around and asking around, and finally someone said, hey, in the back of the market, there's a family that sells fresh organic chicken. And I said, oh, my God, where? <laughs> and so we went back, and we bought one the first time, and we thought, nah, they can't be organic. So I, I had done a little research and found that if they're three to four months old, they're more likely to be organic than the ones that are the hormone shot chickens. And those are two, three, four weeks. So I said, so tell me how old are these chickens? And she goes, oh, usually between three and four months. And we don't use any hormones. We don't use any bad stuff. Uh, we're the only ones in the market who do that. And so for $1.80 a pound, we put a standing order for five pounds a week of chicken and so we make all kinds of various things with chicken but like this morning I went I got five pounds of chicken for less than ten dollars that's awesome and, yeah and so pretty much we're for two people eating really well at home organic food completely from the get-go we're spending in addition to fish and chicken both we're probably spending about thirty dollars a week uh, that's that's nothing <laughs> no. And we couldn't get that much organic chicken for $30 a right. week back in the States. Right. So I had really been committed to this idea of healthy living and good air, good water, good food, 
exercise and um, I, I, I believe that Ecuador and especially Crucita, this area here where we live, has really totally met my expectations to answer that oh, question. That's great. That's fantastic. So Marianne, when it comes to one of the things that you mentioned too was was around stress and and how your stress levels you know were pretty pretty intense and so let me ask you then when it comes to life in Ecuador and in Crucita particularly um, how has that changed has it has it been quite a bit different Yeah, I would say a complete well I don't know if three hundred and sixty would probably be a good total turnaround because I was working probably. Uh, 18, 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and you wonder why you get sick. Uh, but, you know, keeping up with the client load and the various uh, road trips I had to make in order to do the kind of work I was doing uh, really took its toll on my health, and I ended up with several different cancers over a period of time. And I, I guess one of the things I've learned is I'm not a gentle tap on the shoulder kind of gal. It takes a sledgehammer to get my attention. And so moving to Ecuador, I was able to completely shift my stress. And my doctors have said, you really, really need to lower your stress level. It's killing you. Really? And so recently I had a conversation with uh, my general practitioner and he said you know you've done absolutely everything I could possibly ask of a patient you've moved your location you've changed your lifestyle you've changed the what you eat you've changed your level of exercise you've changed your level of stress and uh, you're just a completely different person to talk to now as a result of that and I you know he said most of my patients don't really follow any of his advice for the most part until they get seriously <laughs> ill. Right. And I think that, that tends to be kind of a, a common thing in the U.S. You kind of chase it down from behind after you've totally trashed yourself. Mm -hmm. You chase it down to try to fix it. And, and so I began to think was, why don't I be proactive and change the things I can? And the way I live now, I'm in charge of my own schedule. I schedule my clients online for Skype. Uh, conversations or consultations when I want. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I write when I want uh, and I can walk and I've lost 20 pounds in the time that I've been here just from wow. changing wow. the stress level. I mean, they say that people who are highly stressed have cortisol just shooting through. I mean, you might as well have just, you know, put up a IV for cortisol and, and adrenaline for me because that's pretty much how I was living. I would say that might be a bit of a sticky point for some people. If you're used to drive, drive, drive all the time and suddenly it's tranquil, it's yeah. peaceful, you walk to go get your food, your water, your whatever, you can walk out the front door and you've got this beautiful beach to walk on and you don't necessarily run into anyone so you don't have the stress of even saying hello if you don't want to. <laughs> and you can swim and... Um, I think the sound of the ocean is very soothing also. So I pretty much have reversed my aging, I think, as well as uh, improved my quality of life dramatically by living here. But it's been an adjustment to my pace. Sure. And so I guess what I've realized is that I can go looking for stress out on the internet. I can go... <laughs> read the news and scour all the papers and go looking for things that I would post on my uh, Twitter account or my work Facebook or whatever. But I have had to sort of put myself a little bit on a diet of how much outside news I can tolerate without getting upset. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that makes perfect sense. It used to be, you know, I had to always be aware of the next thing so that I could help you know tr help a client if they were getting targeted by x y or z so now my only job really is to be happy well, and that's a completely uh, different world yeah and i bet too you know like on that point as far as your actual clients and trying to stay up on information so that you can you know be able to provide for them i i would probably guess that now that you've kind of disconnected from all that you're probably a lot more creative and in a lot of ways you've been able to help your clients even more because you're not so, so, you know, connected to it all, all the time. Yes. I, I would say I've got, received a very interesting perspective and I would, I would put it under the heading of world citizen. That's how I would put it. 
it's different than being an expat. I mean, I find that term expatriate to be kind of like, oh God, you're disconnecting from the mothership and yeah. how dare you, you know, <laughs> you're a traitor. Right. And instead, what I have found is, uh, you're right, the idea of creativity has been much more free flowing. Um, I have more uh, access to my intuition because it's not so crowded mm -hmm. with, oh my God, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do this. Um, and sort of a, a, an overwhelming sense of calm, which has not been my nature really up to this point. Um, I'm driven, and my father would say, like a bulldog with a bone, I just won't let go of things. <laughs> and that serves when you have to be a communication director for a campaign or for a company, but when your life is run by that, you yourself lose sight of the joy of life, I think. Yeah, So that's a great it's point. Tricky. It's tricky. It's, a, it's an interesting balance to hit. I may have swung kind of the other way now to being so relaxed. I don't have as much of an inclination to drive, drive, drive sure. as, like I did before. I'm kind of liking this. Well, it sounds, it sounds like you're going at, a, at whatever pace is comfortable for you at the time. Yeah. And that's, that's a much healthier you know, way to go. And, and I just, I'm respecting my inner prompting. You know, I'm listening more instead of uh, reacting all the time, yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I just wanted to note something too. Earlier, you were talking about uh, just you know energy and and going back to the health things and everything too. Uh, one of the things I I just you know can't help but to notice, but your energy is amazing. I mean, you've got just this you know beaming amount of energy, and Thank you. and it's just really it's really fantastic and refreshing. And so what I'm what I'm wondering is, do you feel like you had this level of energy and, and you were able to express it? Uh, like you currently do before moving to Ecuador or has that shifted or changed since you've actually moved down there? I think that's a really good question. I don't know that you can separate, um, like I can definitely say going through radiation and cancer treatment, I could barely lift my head off the pillow and I would practically fall asleep mid sentence. Um, and I would say that my skin and I just look ravaged. I, I don't look that way now. I think in part because I, I use some lovely skin care products that, that are from the company Jeunesse. And I love their skin uh, care products. But I, I think there is an inner part as well that's meeting the outer part mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is really important. Um, I, it's a really good question because I'm fairly vibrant by nature just because I find I'm insatiably curious uh, and uh, some people would maybe even call it ferociously curious and that, that's a, you know, that can get you into a little bit of trouble sometimes too. But I would say I've never felt this calm, I've never felt this uh, peaceful, uh, I've never felt this sort of... Uh, Balanced energy, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you know. There's a there's a kind of overcompensating energy when you drive, drive, drive all yep. the time. Yep. Uh, and certainly when you're not feeling well, you pretty much avoid people, so yeah. <laughs> they don't have well, to see it. It's a really good point that you bring up because I can say, I mean, I think the last time I felt this much or or, or that kind of a balance, you know, energy that you're talking about was probably close to 15 years ago before I started piling on all the stresses of, you know, getting married, like to be able to provide for my spouse, um, you know, having, having children and, you know, thinking about having to provide for the children. Yeah. So it's, it's just completely different. And, uh, and, and that's one of my big, you know, drives or motivations to trying to, um, you know, move abroad is that I feel like that, that'll kind of removing myself from this, environment will give me the opportunity to kind of slow down, go at a, at a better pace or an easier pace. And I think really just kind of set my own pace really. And well, I think you're very wise to recognize that. Um, and at a young age, rather than waiting another 20 years, and then you look back on your life and you say, Oh my God, what happened to my life? It yeah. disappeared. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess I would say that maybe one of the things that and I don't think it's just because I live near the ocean, but 
I would say my level of stress, while I was yeah pretty conscious of it, but not enough to really do anything about it until I got sick and decided that I would, you know, change my life. Um, it was a little like being a fish in water and the fish going, water? What's that? <laughs> you're just kind of like, you're in it and you live with it. And it's, it's part of the American way that there's a culture of busyness and a culture of, oh, well, I stayed up all night. How about you? <laughs> you know? yeah. There's a glorification of being busy. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's one of the biggest adjustments that people who come from the United States have here because suddenly, I mean, the Ecuadorian culture is very laid back. In fact, I thought at first that maybe they were kind of depressed because I saw them laying around in their hammocks. And finally, I asked someone and I said, you know, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm curious, is, is he depressed because I see him laying in his hammock? And they go, well, what you didn't see is he went to work at 3 in the afternoon and he was fishing all night long and he just got back at 6 a.m., came home, had some breakfast, and now he's in the hammock resting. He earned that resting time. Yeah. And we work as much as we have to work to earn that hammock time. <laughs> I don't think there's really an equivalent in the United States. If you are in your hammock, you would be considered lazy and sloughing off. And instead, here, it's like they make time for their family. I wish you could see the beach where... These families, they, they dig a beautiful hole in the sand. The mothers, the grandmothers, the kids, the, you know, the, the mothers, the fathers, the kids, the grandparents, everybody sits in this hole and the water just washes in and washes out. And they sit there for hours and chat and pass the babies around. Then they get up. They go on to the Malacon here, the, the, the walkway here, yep. and they find a restaurant. They eat. Then they come back and they dig the hole again. And <laughs> this is an entire day of just being with family and so they will work all week long to afford to have that beautiful meal with their families have that extra beer that they would like to have that yeah. are a dollar fifty for the equivalent of two beers in one and you know i have a lot of respect for that and i don't see that in the u.s it's like the average is 20 minutes per day that parents have time for their kids so i guess i i think there's different whole different cultural dynamic going on here in Ecuador that is a bit of a puzzlement to the Americans who are, you know, drive, drive, okay, drive, go. achievement, achievement, uh, achievement. Yeah. And then yeah. they don't have anything to do because they're retired and they can't, they can't, they can't find a place. Mm -hmm. So instead they all kind of glom together and stick together. And uh, I think they're missing a big piece of the beauty of this culture and the heart of these people yeah. who yeah. are so generous and so... You know, they enfold you into their lives, and then they will defend you with their life. I mean, they, if they hear any bad talk, agua, uh, you know, habla mala behind your back, they will, like, come to you and make sure you know what's going on because you don't want to have that in your life. And so it's all about the quality of life instead of the not really having a life and it costing you your life, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, to that point, I think for, for my wife and I and moving abroad, because we've come across, uh, well, actually, I think, you know, my wife is Ecuadorian. Uh, when she was, I guess, around 15 or so, her and her family moved over here. And uh, so we've come close to moving back to Ecuador twice. Um, she's also got her father's side, which is Italian. And um, so we've That's got a nice. lot of, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic combination. Um, yeah. Really good food, too. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the one, the, the one biggest, I guess, challenge or hurdle that we've had to make the move, um, you know, twice now, well, I actually, I, I take that back. The first time, uh, was related to my, my father-in-law's health. My wife decided that she didn't want to move away from her father because his health was, you know, he's getting a little older. Uh, wow. and actually during that time frame, he ended up, uh, suffering from a stroke. So it was a good thing that we ended up not going. Yeah. Uh, this last time, uh, the big hurdle or challenge has been that we've got a eight month year old little boy and we've got a three and a half year old little girl. And so my wife is thinking about them from a medical facility, uh, standpoint, as far as having, you know, good care for them at such a young age and everything. Um, obviously I know Ecuadorian families have kids down there and, uh, we actually have a lot of friends that are on the coast. We've got friends in Bahia, they've got small children yeah. Uh, but my mother-in-law recently took a trip to to Ecuador, and she she went down to Bahia, checked out the coast, and and she was in uh, in Bahia when she was there. She actually went and and looked at the medical facility and 
the well, she actually said that she was concerned about the fact that there was only, I think she said there was maybe two doctors and she just felt like, you know, for us with the children that it probably wouldn't make, a, you know, a good, a good option for us at this time. And so I'm just curious, you know, from your perspective, since you live there in Crucita, which is even smaller than, than Bahia, yeah. um, you've had, you know, the cancer and, and you've gone through those treatments, um, you know, it seems like your, your health has actually improved since going down there, but yeah. how, what, what kind of obstacles, either mental or just physical, have you, have you had to deal with any, or has, has it really not been an issue since moving to Ecuador? Um, I guess really what I'm trying to get to is, is, you know, for my own sake, what could make me feel more comfortable about the idea of moving down there for my children from a medical perspective? Well, you mentioned both the medical and the educational. I know that, at least from an educational standpoint, uh, President Correa is really working on overhauling the educational system and probably waiting a little while until they get that figured out is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. I know they closed about 14 universities that were performing at subpar level, but at the same time, they've opened up a new university uh, for teachers because they really, they have a shortage of really good teachers. And it used to be here, from what I'm told, I, I just did a lecture at the Monte University about how to become a more powerful speaker. And I talked to the professors there, and they said that the originally, uh, when you were trying to become a doctor or a lawyer, that if you failed the exams for those two, you got to be a teacher. And so it was kind of like a come down that oh, wasn't you know exactly you know, the blue ribbon. Yeah. And, but now, uh, apparently they, they now have a university that you just opened this year. They made the exam to get in so hard that the opening class of teacher training is I think either 16 or 18 people from all over Ecuador. So they've now elevated this perception that teaching is a noble profession, like being a doctor or being a lawyer here. And a lot of the, they're, they're putting out a call for the teachers who left when the, the dollar collapsed in 91, I think it was, a, was it 2001, 91, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah, I, it was, it was yeah, I don't in the 90s, I think. Yeah, there was, a, there was a dollar collapse and two million Ecuadorians left uh, to go to the United States and Europe to uh, build lives and rebuild the money that just disappeared for them. So they've put out a call to university professors, and by 2017, 70% of their university professors will need to have a doctorate, which, oh my God, I don't think that's true in the United States. So there's a, there's a level of education that is being uh, brought up, and I think that includes doctors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you a little bit about my experience so far with the medical profession, and I think it really has to do with where you are living. Uh, we were up in Quank, uh, we were up in Quito handling our permanent residency with our lawyer there, and we were staying uh, with some friends in Cumbaya, which mm -hmm. is just south of Quito. I mean, if you're looking for everything the U.S. has to offer and more, I mean, you want the IMAX, you want the University Hospital, you want the doctors high class, they're all there. Right. You can get everything you ever wanted in a mall there. Right. Root got very sick. My husband got very, very sick. He ended up with um, a um, bacterial and a parasitic infection, and we don't know where he got that. But he was so ill, he could barely walk. We got to the uh, hospital there, and what's really interesting is we felt that the actual facility was top-notch, as good as anything we'd seen in the U.S. Uh, we did not have medical insurance. And to see the doctor do all the tests uh, and, you know, have a couple of other little uh, questions answered, plus all of the Pedialyte and uh, antibiotics you could ever want for treating this situation, it cost us $70. <laughs> okay, so cut to, I, we live in Crucita. Um, three weeks ago, I got really bad food poisoning. I don't know where probably something in the soil. I probably didn't wash something properly enough. And that's just, you know, the luck of the draw. Well, I waited three days thinking it would resolve itself. It didn't. It got worse and worse and worse. And this is a common thing that people have to deal with in any foreign country. So I'm not criticizing anything to do with the soil in Ecuador by any means. But one of the 
blends of being here, which I find fascinating, is I wrote up in Spanish what my symptoms were. My husband walked over to the pharmacy, handed her the symptoms. She sent him home with the antibiotics I needed, a four-day course, and probiotics for the bacteria in my system that the antibiotics were killing. And that's unusual for, I don't remember that ever happening no. to me. So you have to kind of self administer your probiotics after your antibiotics yep. and Pedialyte. So one of the interesting things is that the pharmacists are trained like any kind of drugs for the most part. I think with the exception, some people have told me of high end painkillers. Pain if you need things like Percocet, things like that that are really, I forget what you call those, um, yeah. uh, high end pain relief. Uh, you can't get that here because the their issue with they wanted to make sure that they were curtailing any kind of drug running going on. So, but anything else that you normally have to, in the States, go to a doctor, get a prescription, go to the pharmacy. You can just go right to the pharmacy and get what you need. They're familiar with bacterial infections, parasitic infections, and if you need um, further tests or the first round doesn't work, then you go to the clinic. There's a clinic nearby here a block away, and my neighbor downstairs got pneumonia, and he went there, and they gave him a mask and sent him home with antibiotics, had him checked, and he also got into a car accident on his motorcycle. Well, the doctor who came to the scene rode with him in the ambulance to the hospital, really? made sure that he was okay because they weren't sure if he was internally bleeding, and stayed with him the entire time while he was being x-rayed, making sure that he was okay. and. You know, that's a different level of commitment personally to the humanity of the human being. You do not feel like you're a number. Mm -hmm. But if you were seriously ill, like there is a cancer hospital here, and uh, I had gone through my five years of breast cancer uh, time, which frankly in the U.S., I think they give you that to make you so nervous you get it again, but I did not, and I... Thought it was time that, you know, the five-year check. Um, and I went to the public hospital, that's the cancer hospital, and um, that was a little different because you waited in line to get your number, and then you waited in line to get your doctor, mm -hmm. and then you waited in line to get your number for your next appointment. So it was a not a private healthcare system. And... I went to see what the public health care system was like here. Everyone was treated with respect. The doctor said, you know, we don't need to see you. Bye-bye. And so it isn't like the states where there's kind of a, a kind of you get into the system and it's like you, you can't get out. Right. Um, so I understand and I have yet to look into this myself. There is a... Uh, private health care mm -hmm. and my understanding from the people that I know here is it's about six, 55 to 65 dollars a month to be able to see a private physician the worst thing I've had Lane in a year of being here is three infected mosquito bites and that food poisoning three weeks ago right yeah so you know from a medical standpoint I think it depends on where you are uh, I think if you needed to get to a major hospital for a more high-level, high-end care, say in, in Quito, it's a 35-minute plane right. ride from here. Right. So, and your I, I, your I airfare look, your airfare is probably cheaper than your medical bill would be in the states. Well, let me tell you this: <laughs> I was paying eight hundred and sixty-five dollars a month just to cover myself in healthcare insurance. Yeah. yeah. So. I haven't paid a dime in a year on healthcare insurance, and I'll tell you what, the, the Pedialyte, the antibiotic, and the probiotic that my husband got cost $7.25. <laughs> so you, so currently, you do not have insurance down there then, is what? No, I don't. I, and, you know, I am so, it's like that fish in the water. Where's the water? Oh my God, what if something bad happens? What right. if? And my doctor and I were talking about this, and he said, why are you going looking for trouble? You've done all the changes I could yeah. ever ask. You're looking for a problem. Yeah. Don't go there. Right. So, 
it's I almost have... we're conditioned here to to feel like we need that and what just if in case. And, yeah just in case and that's something that you know we i know my family we really suffer from that of, of you know well, what if this well what if that and you try to find the perfect scenario or the perfect balance and it's like well wait you know we're not there and why are we even going there let's just focus on the here and the now and the moment and let's right. appreciate it and you know when that is a problem if it becomes a problem then we'll deal with it but until it's a problem i'm not going to make it one well and that's what my doctor was trying to beat into my thick skull you know you don't have to uh go looking for problems when there aren't any if in fact there becomes a problem you have them send me your whatever and I will have it reviewed by someone in the States just to double check. But I guess I, I do hear a lot of people having concerns. Well, what if something bad happens to me here? So far, it, I've been treated with great respect. The pharmacists have been able to handle any kind of minor need, uh, major need. The hospital facility was top notch. Mm -hmm. And the other thing they have is they have their, their labs also right there, so you don't have to go to another location to get your lab test done and then bring your, you know, your printout to your doctor. It's, it's kind of, it's organized sure. well. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I would say that you could pretty much find what you needed when you needed it as far as healthcare is concerned. Um, as far as education, it depends. I mean, if your children are bilingual, are they? They are. are. They, both, they, yeah. they are. They're actually so, tri trilingual. Oh, trilingual. Okay, right, because Italian, right. Uh, Spanish, Correct. and English. Yep. So my feeling is they would do fine here. Yeah, and, and I'm less concerned about the education um, because my, my wife, you know, actually um, went to school there, and when she came – from so she her last school experience in Ecuador was actually in Bahia, and she ah. went to school with the the nuns is what you know it was it was the nuns and so um, yeah. when she came over to the states they were actually she was actually ahead from the equivalent you know grade in the United States and so things that they were learning in school you know they were concerned actually when they came over because they didn't speak English. Um, but they picked up the English so fast and they were ahead on things like the math and, you know, all these different categories or whatever. So, you know, the education I'm not too concerned about because I know that, um, you know, I, I think we'll be fine there. And I also believe that education, you know, needs to be addressed in the home too. So that's something yeah. that, you know, my wife, we're always working with my daughter on things like the counting and she yeah. already knows how to spell her name, you know, those kind of things. So. Yeah, and you can creatively address those gaps, uh, even if they're in the United States system. You know, I was always doing that at home, sure. creating games right. and various things to help my kids learn. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things I observe, at least in the school system here, is they have a sense of pride. So one of my friends has a child who's three, and he went to a school that is teaching him the equivalent of what I remember my children learning starting in kindergarten and grade. And he was sent home to his mother with a message saying she was not cleaning his uniform properly and it needed to be cleaner. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, one day he goes to school in blue slacks and a white button down shirt with a tie. Mm -hmm. One, two days a week, he goes in gray sweats and a white t-shirt with white tennis shoes. And another day, he goes, I forget the other third uniform, but there is a tremendous sense of pride. And these people, some of them are washing their clothes by hand. I don't know how they get the dirt out right. because there's a lot of like dirt roads and playing out in the dirt and they don't have the same kind of washing machines. Right. They're so easily accessible in somewhere like the States, but they have uniforms and each school has its uniform and there is a sense of pride. And when you get to be a senior, you get a special pair of sweatpants that says graduating this year. And, um, it isn't like private school fuddy duddy. It's, it's very much a sense of, uh, of pride in yourself. Yeah. And the mother, my friend got this message, like, I'm not cleaning the shoes. She goes, Oh God. And she started like 
Right. <laughs> tissues and leaving them out in the sun. And she had to get advice how to get them white enough to pass muster for her son's school. Well, there's, so, there, there's I, your, I, yeah, there's your stress in Ecuador. <laughs> yeah. Get your shoes clean. Uh, so, you know, I think there's, there's a, there's a, a real sense of pride here in how things are done and how things get done. And, um, I know there's another interesting thing that I've noted uh, that the uh, people who come here from the United States have a problem with, and you may have covered this in other interviews, but that they have to wait so long to get their food. No, <laughs> no, I haven't heard that one yet. Oh yeah. They go, when's the food coming? Like how long do we have to wait here? Yeah. And what they don't realize, and, and I took some cooking lessons from my neighbors who run a restaurant, they're running a, an entire restaurant on three gas burning stoves on one side and three gas burning out things on the other side, mm. one of which has their dog food that is boiling for the day. And what they don't realize is everything is made from scratch. Your ceviche is made from scratch. The dish is fresh. It's cooked fresh. It's everything is chopped fresh for you for that plate. I couldn't believe it. You know, yeah, when I was learning up. just to learn how to make a empanada, they have to go get the green bananas, the, the plantains. The plantains. Yeah. They yeah. have to boil them for 15 minutes. Then they have to mash them. And I, now you know why the Ecuadorian women have amazing uh, <laughs> arms because it is so hard to smash a green plantain. And it's, you stretch it until it becomes like pasta dough. Yeah. And then you cook it. Then you fry it. And I was like stunned. I thought surely they've got extra ones in the back. And they don't. They make everything fresh to order because the assumption is when you come to sit in a restaurant, you're there to have a conversation. Yeah. Imagine that. It's not that fast food. Yeah. So it's, we're, what we're, is, we're, we're not used to that. We're not conditioned to, we're expecting it a lot faster and everything is frozen and, and yeah, it's not fresh. And we've forgotten it. what that's like. We've forgotten what that's like. So then when they finally do get their food, they're kind of annoyed. So, of course, they're having a little trouble digesting it. And then the Ecuadorians will not return until you ask them for the check because it's assumed that they're being rude and rushing you out the door if they come and say, are you done yet? Do you want the check? Mm -hmm. That would be considered very, very rude. Yeah. And I've had to point that out to people coming from the States on more than one occasion. Um as they've gotten increasingly agitated at the speed of things. So that is one thing that I think uh, is a difficult adjustment, that things are much slower. Bureaucracy is slower. Food is slower. Life moves at a slower pace. Things don't work. The internet goes in and out. The electricity goes on and off. The water is currently off to Crescita because of a dispute politically between Manta on one side and Puerto Viejo on the other, and they're squeezing poor Crucita in the middle. So you just learn to go with the flow, uh, or lack thereof, I guess, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, make it work. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's a really good point, because I know a lot of people, when I talk to them about moving abroad... Um, you know, or even Americans, let's say, that don't really kind of understand that that idea or what the appeal would be because they, they, they already know a lot of these things, you know, just by the fact that the country might be grouped or classified as a third world country. And so one of the things that I like to point out is that it's it's not so much that life is next necessarily going to be better there or it's better here or that America is a perfect country or that it's not. It's more about picking your priorities and what is important to you, and and you're gonna have there's gonna be trade offs, and yeah, so yeah, so it sounds like that's kind of what you were just describing is some of the trade offs, and and I guess what I'd be interested to know is if there is there one thing or what are the biggest things that you would say are you could maybe classify as negatives or that you've really had to get adjusted to, you know they're almost kind of like a thorn in in, in your side as far as. Uh, you know, your, your life in Ecuador now that you've been there for a year? Well, I would say one of them is what I've had to deal with all my life, and that's mosquitoes. Um, I just have what they call sweet blood, I guess, because uh, <laughs> when you go, my husband and I and other people will be in the same farm walking along, and I've got a mosquito swarm around me, and they don't. Yeah. Um, 
So I have been looking for various products that don't have DEET in them, mm -hmm. and uh, I have yet to find one that works. So one of the things that I've had to make an adjustment, I mean, one of the great things about living in the building that I'm in is I'm up on the sixth floor. So I am three floors down, I went to have dinner in the middle of winter, and I got bit 16 times. Now, up on my apartment up here, the condo up here, we don't get that because there's much there's much more of a breeze blowing by. Mm -hmm. But we went to go have dinner at another person's house who's on in a regular Ecuadorian level house, and the Ecuadorians went, "Oh God, you're wearing black. You really should wear white. The mosquitoes like they go to black." And I thought, "Wow, no one's ever said that to me." So I started wearing white. And thanks to the Ecuadorians, it's a little better. Really? Yeah. But I would have to say, we've now discussed this about a hundred times. Where in the world am I going to be able to go that doesn't have mosquitoes? Right. So that's my own issue. So I can't really blame that on Ecuador per se. Um, but if you do have a sensitivity to mosquitoes, that would be something that you wouldn't want to be in a ground level house uh, without lots of fans going. So it sounds like some of your advice then would be essentially try to get a condo up high and wear as much white as you possibly can. <laughs> well, that's one way. I would say also have good fans because when air is circulating around you, they don't just, they don't get on you, on you quite sure. as, as easily. Okay. Um, so let's see, there's other pet peeves. Well, I'll tell you what, before you move on to, to other things, I'll just point out something that I, I saw that I thought was kind of interesting. On my last trip to Ecuador, it was my first time down to the coast, and we were in Bahia. And um, I remember when we, we pulled in, and we're getting out of the car, and I, I forget what it was. I think there was maybe a, a loud horn or you know some kind of announcement going on. And uh, turn around, and, and you look, and, and you see there's basically a truck being driven around the city, and they're spraying, I don't know, is it is it DEET or what is it? Some kind of fume, fumigation to basically tame the, the mosquitoes or what have you. And so essentially you just go running into the house and it was just kind of weird. I'm like, I feel like I'm being, you know, poisoned or something. I don't know how to describe it, but it was just, it was definitely bizarre and kind of odd. And so to your point, the mosquitoes are, are pretty bad. Well, you know, I don't know whether they're... Also, no see -em bugs, because sometimes I'll be bit and I'll think, I should have seen that. I mean, my hand was out here. How come I didn't see that? So I don't know what no see look like, because, of course, you can't see them. But Bahia has a, you know, is supposed to be the recycle city and yeah. the go yeah. green, the green city. The green, right. So that seems to be in contrast with the party line of what Bahia is supposedly billing itself. One of the challenges, and maybe this is true in any bureaucratic system, but one of the challenges of being in a culture where actually English is not the first spoken language is the bureaucracy can be very, very intimidating for a person from the United States who does not have the Spanish skills to navigate. And to that person, I would say it probably doesn't matter whether you speak English or you don't speak English. Uh, you speak Spanish or you don't speak Spanish, get a lawyer to walk you through the process of going into getting your permanent residency and uh, making sure that you fulfill the requirements of the two years in order to then apply and wait your next year for your passport, if that's a direction you would like to go. Even when you do have a lawyer, you can be sitting for a long time and so you can move from section to section and pull your ticket in line to be called up to the front to turn in your documents. And I swear, when we were trying to figure out where we needed to go, if we hadn't had a lawyer, I mean, we drove in her car to one side of Quito, to the other side of Quito, to the other side of Quito, to the different government offices that needed to have the paperwork in order for us to fulfill our permanent residency application. Mm -hmm. So I would just have someone help you. Uh, I did, and I do speak Spanish, but even my Spanish is not enough 
to navigate the governmental bureaucracy of being here. So that would be one thing that's a little challenging and perhaps uh, daunting, I would even say. Uh, don't try to do it yourself would be my advice. I think it'll go smoother and you'll get it done right the first time. And I've heard some very big horror stories. Another aspect that I've heard a lot of people tell their own horror stories, but I did not have one, uh, is shipping your stuff here. Uh, a lot of people get taken advantage of by hiring the wrong company to fill a container mm -hmm. to ship it from whatever part of the United States or Europe. And we found a great company uh, that is based in Cuenca, and we had absolutely zero problems. Really? Everything, everything was filled out properly. When we had to come into customs, they did the customs work for us. We just simply signed a power of attorney to them. Uh, they took care of all, all the translation, and we got our stuff in three weeks. Uh -huh. I know people who waited five months and kept paying for mm -hmm. the storage at customs because they had not done their paperwork properly. So that cost them thousands of dollars they didn't need to pay. Wow. And I think one of the one of the benefits we had was we were going over with our my Ecuadorian friends. You know, these are the people we're considering using for a shipment, and this is the person, this is the lowest price we could find. And they went, that is way too low. If you pay that, you are going to get screwed somewhere along the line. It's going to happen. I don't trust that. Give me that name. Give me that company. I will send my lawyer out on it and research it for you. Ultimately, we found that there was a lot of fine print that was sure. verbal and not written. And so we ended up paying a little bit more, but we got it done right the first time. We talked to all of the references. We got our stuff. Nothing was broken. Um, and I'll tell you what, we had 188 boxes and the customs people went through 158 of our boxes. Wow. So you better follow the rules is another thing. If they found one thing wrong, or we heard a story of a, a couple whose translator took box two and put it on le line three. Oh, and, and that's, yeah, every throws everything box off. off. Yeah. The moment they opened one box and it was wrong, they went, they're lying. And they opened everything and that container stayed in customs and you know they had to really work hard to get it out mm -hmm. so there that's another aspect of I guess bureaucratic to get your stuff here and make it feel like home you asked me you know what was it and I, I haven't really answered your question yet what is it that I miss or that's really hard for me um, and I would say I miss seeing my children I miss seeing my good friends. Sure. And so one of the things that I've done, like we used to be texting all the time. My kids are 22 and 25 now. So, you know, the majority is texting um, or a quick Facebook message or, you know, something quick. Mm -hmm. And we found uh, the, the app. It's called Whats app. W-H-A-T-T. Well, wait, I'm spelling it wrong. W-H-A-T-S-A-P-E. Uh -huh. Yep. And we, my son is in South Korea right now working, and my daughter's in Canada right now working. And we shoot each other, you know, a WhatsApp message all the time. Yep. Like every day, practically. Yep. And we found Line, L-I-N-E, another app that we are able to use. As long as you have internet access, you can call anywhere in the world for free. Um, really? And it's like a Skype to Skype. So. Oops, sorry, I touched the, my hands get going. Some people actually <laughs> accuse me of being Italian because I'm talking with my hands. <laughs> well, not accuse me, uh, inquire as to whether I'm Italian. <laughs> I wink is my uh, response to that. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, the idea of communication was really tough. I felt cut off at the beginning because I was so used to being with them in person or being able to go out and have coffee in person. So what I've done instead to try to offset some of that is my girlfriends and I will get a cup of tea or get a cup of coffee made and then we'll set up a Skype session like this. Oh, that's awesome. And we'll sit and we'll have what we call, you know, our virtual chats or our virtual coffee and 
it's not getting a hug, but it's a visual treat your comfort, you know, and, and yeah. a, it's good for my heart. My kids and I, we talk all the time on, on the, you know, texting, but now and then we create, I just had a Skype call with them the other day, holiday time, uh, in the States. And, um, you know, it's just really good to see their face. Yeah, sure. So, um, um just people. Yeah, absolutely. So have your uh, children made it down yet to visit you guys down there? Not yet. My son is working on a paper in Korea and they committed him. He's on a Princeton fellowship and the terms of the agreement was he would not leave for a single day for a year. Wow. Uh, while he's working on this paper. Um, and my daughter is on tour uh, with a show that's heading into Broadway in the spring. So um, she's committed. And what's really interesting, he, this, is a, this is another aspect of living in a foreign country. It's weird because my friends in New York, it's closer to just hop on a plane and go the five hours to Ecuador on to Quito than it is to go from Seattle to New York. Sure. Right. And it's this perception that, oh, my God, you're on the other side of the world and you're so far away. And, you know, I at first I got a little miffed because I realized that some of my friends considered friendship to be geographically mm -hmm. contained. Sure. And that's where I got really disappointed. And I got hurt. And uh, I think a couple of friendships really suffered as a result of that. But the ones who don't have the same geographical perception of, oh my God, you're so far away. Um, they don't have the same problem. A sure. conversation on Skype is, 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 is great. Yeah. My kids, unfortunately at this time in their busy work life, they're busy working. So it's harder for them to get away. Mm -hmm. So we pretty much just console ourselves with either I'm coming to visit you. I'll, I'll come see your Broadway opening in March or I'll get to you in South Korea before the Princeton Fellowship ends. Maybe it's just me is the one traveling right now. Um, they both would love to see Ecuador. Sure. Um, and, you know, I hope one day they'll be able to do that in their busy schedule. So, you know, that would be true regardless of where I lived, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you then, too, with, with making your move abroad, mm -hmm. um, I guess one of the big things that I'm always interested in is, is income. And so, you know, obviously you still have your, your business. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're not actually retired. There's, there's kind of a, a couple different categories of people that I find, you know, as far as when I'm interviewing people, there's, you've got your, your, uh, retired people, and then you've got people that have remote income. Um, and, and those are really the two big buckets, I guess we could say. So you're still running your business and you're able to produce income. And I think yeah. that's, you know, very, uh, I guess, a very big point of interest for a lot of the audience to be able to know, you know, kind of that process, what that's like and how, how that is as far as being able to produce an income virtually or, or remotely. Yeah, it's a really good question, Lane, because one of the things I, we were looking into when we first were looking at various countries to go in and live in were the residency requirements. And for Ecuador, if you're a married couple, uh, you have to prove, you have three different ways that you can prove your, uh, and then I'll get to your question in just a second because it's, it's related to uh, virtual income. The one spouse has to prove $800 of guaranteed income such as social security. And to bring a spouse, you have to add, it has to be 900 minimum. Okay. Uh, other countries have different requirements, but in Ecuador it's not it's 900 for a married couple or 800 guaranteed for a single person. Or you have to buy a piece of property that's worth $25,000 or put $25,000 in the bank and leave it there. The problem with buying a piece of property for 25,000 is the valuation here is low. Like you could, you could have a piece of property that's worth twenty five, but they'll value it at three thousand. Oh, really? And yeah, because it's the taxable value. It may sell for twenty five thousand or fifty thousand, or you may, you know, be buying a house or a condo or whatever for that amount. But unless the government values it at twenty five thousand, you're kind of off the hook there. So 
what I've noticed is an awful lot of people here are really squeaking by on retirement income. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for ways to make an income. But a lot of them are running into restrictions. Well, they say, if I earn X amount, I lose my retirement guarantee. And so, you know, then it's like, uh, and then back and forth and back and forth. Well, the United States government says you can earn up to $250,000, I believe, without, is that right? Without what? Without uh, being penalized. Um, From, you mean as far as like? With solo, like an entrepreneur like myself. You mean as far as taxation is concerned? Uh, yeah, as far as um, before you're assessed a tax uh, yeah. in the country, I think you can earn up to it's, 250 I think it? it's 98, it's 98,000 if you're, or 99,000 or something like that if you're single, and then if you're married, it's, I think it's twice that. Okay, so I, I was off by uh, about $70,000. Yeah. Huh. We should get that cleared up. Well, no, that, that's fine. I actually, uh, it's interesting you say that though, because I do have an interview um, with a, a CPA that specializes in expats. And so that's one of the big things that he covers in the interview. Well, really make sure that I get to see that interview because I want to make sure. <laughs> well, I'll be seeing all of your interviews, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would really be interested in, because one of the interesting things is the rules are kind of fluctuate. And it, it seems that um, what I've heard is the rules for income shift and, and, and move depending. But if you are a U.S. citizen, you do, we were just really hammered by the my CPA to file the FACTA form by yep. June 30th of this year. Otherwise, the U.S. government can come after you. And so there's a lot of new regulations that a lot of people don't even know about that could get them into trouble. So before someone were to come here as far as earning an income, I think you're right that is I can earn 98, 9,000-ish, um, like I can go and give a lecture and be paid by the university up to 99,000. Um, the average teacher salary doesn't reach that, obviously. Right. But right. what I can do is I can use my Skype for clients who have a writing project, or have a speech project, uh, or have a coaching project, and they want me to help uh, coach the delivery of their speech. Um, but there are clients who really prefer the warm and fuzzy you in, in person. you know, right in the room, mm -hmm. um, and they don't understand. Um, I think more and more as we look at the expense of travel, and we look at uh, the stress uh, on the environment of travel, and the the carbon imprint footprint that you're making by your travel. If you want to be mindful of that, I think we are going to move to a more virtual working environment where people stay home on certain days like they do in the U.S. I just am here located in Ecuador and I can Skype out from here to anything and anyone I need and then their ability to pay me is just the same to my U.S. bank account. Yeah. So... Uh, as far as my writing is concerned, I get a check every month from Amazon for what I earn for my book, and I expect that to just continue forever, uh, and especially as I add new uh, books for people to read. And so there's a, there's a stream of income there. Um, I have been working with a distributor company, I mentioned it only briefly, of the products called Jeunesse. I really like their skincare. So... I buy it at wholesale. If someone wants to buy it for me, they can. That's a source of income stream. So you can be all kinds of, you can be resourceful in all kinds of ways and create these funnels of income mm -hmm. if you are someone who can do that kind of work. For example, if you were designing a website, a lot of that back and forth could be done virtually. Um, the, the, the information that goes on the website is written, can be put up in a design that you can see and exchange back and forth. Um, so it, I guess it really depends on what field of work you're in. And it a lot of people like come here and they don't want to be working, but 
Then they're talking about how they don't have enough money to get by, but they wouldn't have been able to survive in the United States on their retirement. So this is the best they can do. And, you know, I know I'm kind of going in a full circle, but it's something I've given a lot of thought to how to make a virtual working life work because mm -hmm. I'm not prepared to retire. In fact, I don't know that I would ever retire. Um, Cause now you're, now you're going at your pace. Yeah. And now I love working even more because I'm not killing myself to do it. Yeah. So, well, it um, sounds like too, it's, it's almost kind of like, you know, being able to pick your clients and, and you can kind of condition people and say, this is the situation as far as the, you know, the, the way the setup is. And, and I think in a lot of ways too, we almost don't give ourselves enough credit to think about how, you know, the more you kind of in, in a business model, the more you can set up systems and processes and you guide people down that, then the more successful you're going to be because you're controlling that whole process. So Absolutely. this could fit in right with that. This is my communication method. This is how it goes. And you'll actually find that you, you can actually be more productive probably because you're not having to spend the time in the car going to meet the client. And then because you're sitting there in person with them, an hour turns into an hour and a half, two hours, you know, what have you. Where's your day gone? Yeah. 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 Which is something I suffered from a lot when I ran my own business was uh, meeting with clients and, you know, an hour, an hour meeting would turn into two, three hours. Right. Well, and I would say that's very, very true. Um, and I would say that looking at the virtual work world um, evolution, I, I think we can be far more uh, expedient with how we use our time. Uh, I will say that one of the things that is it that I've that I've been working on here as a systems and process idea is I've, I've really come to the understanding over however long I've been doing this speech coaching is that there are 10 speeches that everyone has to give in their lifetime and so I started to isolate those 10 speeches and systems and processes I've been writing another book that could be ending up as a video that then people could as a jump off from the video, have private consulting with me. So you can create uh, systems within a book form. You can put them into video, walk you through the steps sure, sure. and the processes you need. And then if they want to get to you, they know where they can find you. Sure. And right now, you can fly me. Sure, no yeah. problem. I'll come to wherever you are, but you'll be the one who will pay for those expenses. Right. Wouldn't it right. just be easier for us and less expensive for you to fly me? You know, I'm already expensive enough by the hour. You don't want to yeah. have to fly me, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> across but yeah, the so basically creating the, the products, you know, that the different clients could fit into if that fits into your model, if it's something that interests you. Right. Well, and, uh, you know, the other funnel I guess you would look at is because now with my book in the words to thrive by series I'm considered a motivational inspirational speaker writer help you kind of you know handbook of hope kind mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. and so with that comes people wanting to get to you and they want that people will write me all the time and so they'll they'll leave comments on my blogs out on the internet and say, well, I'm handling this thing. What do you think of this idea? Or I had this 78 year old woman write me a letter saying, I want to give your book to a friend of mine who's going on a trip, but I, I don't have time to pull out all the questions for study book groups. And I know that I really need to go through them and I need to give her the book. And could you just send me the study group questions? Cause I really, really, really want to get better. And I'm thinking 78, Go for it. Good for you, you know. <laughs> so I pulled out the study group questions and I sent it to her via email. So I'm constantly in a virtual conversation with Twitter, with words to thrive by on Facebook and various other things. So we're moving that way. Yeah. Sure. But I think there's another and this may be a whole other conversation we could have, but this illusion you have of being close to the person because you're in their Facebook friend. <laughs> right. I know what's going on because I read your blog. Well, that's a piece of the story that I've chosen to tell in that format for that reason. Mm -hmm. But that never tells the whole story. And if you have a personal relationship with me, then I I I hope you'd want to know, you know, what's going on behind all that and know me as your friend or your relative, you know, sister or whatever. Um so 
being in a virtual world has its advantages and disadvantages, just like living in another country. I, I'm much more aware of world citizenry now and that I'm not an expat of the United States, even though I have my United States passport, no question. Um, and I'm proud of, of having grown up and what I've learned, the opportunities that I've been given as a U.S. citizen. And now I want to see how the rest of the world lives sure. and their perspective on the world. And I intend to keep on writing about traveling and seeing what these different countries are like. I will maintain a residence in Ecuador. I would, I'm, that's my plan. Mm -hmm. But I intend to go and see what, how Ecuador is compared to Chile or Uruguay or, you know, other places uh, in South America and explore the beauty of what they have to offer. I mean, I guess one of the challenges of living in a, in a rural community is you don't have the symphony or you don't have the sure. movie theaters, you don't have the art, you don't have the drama, you don't have the music. Right. You hear people's boom boxes going, no question. <laughs> and sometimes the bass is mostly what you hear. <laughs> You look at people having such a good time on the beach and their trunks flipped up and they've got their food and their tent is running off the roof of their car and they've got their boom boxes and they're having a blast. Yeah. So they're going to be there for a few hours and that's their break in their week. So yeah. far be it for me to judge that quality of music. Sure. Well, so, you, you bring up an interesting point though, you know, regarding the other countries and being able to travel and, and experience those other cultures and everything. And I think that's a really good point because a, a lot of times I see, um, in expat conversations or, or, you know, people talking about moving abroad, you know, they, they kind of get, uh, committed or focused or, uh, passionate about one particular country. And, uh, you know, I'm guilty of it myself, but I think that what's interesting, the more I, I kind of in, endeavor on this project and the more I'm, uh, engaging in conversations and the more exposure I get to other countries, the more I'm learning how much each country has to offer. And I think yeah. if we can explore as many of them as possible, you know, we should, and, and maybe we should go more towards that kind of, uh, uh, I don't know if nomadic, you know, style is, is the right way to put it, but maybe, you know, every year you spend somewhere else, or maybe it's every couple of years you're moving to a different place. Well, one of the things I'm learning is that you can get three months. Uh, well, once you're, you have your Ecuadorian uh, permanent residency, which takes you two years, you can leave for nine months, uh, sorry, three months, and you have to be in residence nine. Um, that three months, you can go to Europe. You can go to other countries. New Zealand allows you to come for six months. Mm -hmm. So once you fulfill the residency requirement of Ecuador of the two years, being there nine months of the year for those two years, you only have to touch down in Ecuador once every 18 months. Sure. So then you, of course, if you have your passport, you're free to come and go as you wish, right. as you would in any other country. But what uh, is wonderful is these other countries allow you three months to go and visit there. And I'm thinking, why wouldn't you take it in, especially with all the Airbnb stuff going on? We are finding incredible opportunities to stay places um, that are like $40 a night because they're in someone's guest house. Yeah. And they're in gorgeous neighborhoods, <laughs> in gorgeous places. Right. And... I mean, I have had some terrific experiences with Airbnb, and I think that will be one of the waves of the future where, which will allow, it'll level the playing field a little bit of people's affordability. Sure. And another aspect about the way, at least I think Ecuador has been sold, it's been sold to people as a commodity. It's been sold as a cheap third world country, and I really take issue with that. I think that's a serious mis representation of this beautiful country mm -hmm. and it's far from third world far from third world there are aspects of the coast that you know rural but there are aspects of the united states that are rural and nobody calls it a third world country right so there are some absolutely glorious and beautiful picturesque and modern aspects of ecuador but it's been sold by certain other 
groups uh, as a cheap place for retirees to go. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of there is a there's a misrepresentation where oh you can go and there are lots of expats there and even in Cuenca the Ecuadorians call it gringo land right. where all the Americans are together behind their their little fences and their condos. I mean I live in a condo but I'm out talking on the street every day. Right. Um, they don't ever come out, well, and they don't learn Spanish. Right. And so there is a there's a quality of this cult this this particular country I think has been really misrepresented as a commodity rather than as a beautiful cultural experience as Brazil or you know uh, I mean I just as I guess Colombia which is gorgeous too right. has been you know trashed as a, a, a drug running country. I mean there are issues, but you know, there are some beautiful, beautiful parts of these beautiful countries that have been mislabeled based on someone else's political agenda. Let's just sure. put it that way. Yeah. I, you know, I've actually recognized that as well. I, I see that going on a lot. And what, what I think is uh, kind of interesting is that when I start doing the numbers on me being able to support my family uh, in Ecuador, it's pretty much on par to, to here. Maybe there's you know, a little bit of savings, depending on the city I go to in Ecuador. But at the same time, I mean, for the most part, it's not that different. And, and I think that that's a huge, I mean, that's a huge point that you bring up is that it's been sold as like this cheap country. And, and here's what I would say, 10, 15 years ago, a hundred percent, I would have said that, yes, absolutely. In fact, my jaw was on the floor the first time I went to Ecuador back in 2001 uh, because I couldn't believe how cheap things were and yeah. how beautiful it was and, and you know, everything. It, it was it was like this paradise, and that's why I wanted to move down there. Uh, you know, of course, it had its issues, too. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, hearing stories when I was down there, too, that I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know, I can't believe that. But uh, at the same time, though, you know, property back then was a lot cheaper than it is today. Yeah, it's rising. No mm -hmm. question. Yeah. So, um you know, I yeah. think that that's a that's a really good point, though, that you bring up that people should not their main motivation to move should not be around, you know, trying to get a cheaper cost of living or, you know, it should be more about the experience. And I think if that's your number one goal, you're not going to be disappointed. Oh, I would totally agree. And I think that probably people would have to imagine somewhere between like I would say in this rural area of Ecuador um, on the coast. You can get away with two people living for about fifteen hundred dollars. You go to Kumbaya or Quito, you're going to be upwards of three grand right. or more, more, depending wow. on whatever accommodations that you have chosen to live in. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there's always there's always uh, a choice between what standard of living you want to. Um, reproduce. Mm -hmm. I sure. see a lot of expats trying to reproduce the same level of life they had in the United States. And they do their best. You know, <laughs> do that. Okay, so Marianne, I guess really yeah. the last question I wanted to ask you is um, what do you feel is one action step that the audience could take today to get a step closer to becoming an expat? Well, I think one of the things that my husband and I did was we made a list of everything that was important to us and the quality of life. It was, it was, had a European feel. It was close to the ocean. It had a view of the ocean. Uh, we could afford to live there. Um, the food was, we went over that non GMO, that there was a lot of sunlight. It was warm. Um, somewhat in the tropical to Mediterranean climate most of the year, or could we balance two places against each other where we chased the, we, we never had to spend another cold winter anywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we made a list of the things that were important to us. And then we started doing research and we, we looked at latitude and longitude, where what had the climate range that we liked and what countries fell within that mm -hmm. uh, range. And um, then we started looking at photographs on the internet. We started looking at various 
blogs that were being written about this is what it's really like, the down and dirty, you know, or uh, this is how to survive this country and this is how to survive this country. And um, so what we discovered is that you choose first the place that meets as many of those criteria as you can. And then you get used to being outside of the country where you're coming from. I mean, I a lot of people here, they kind of always gauge how close they are to the United States as if they could then bolt back down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm only three hours from right. my, you know. And so there's this, this quality of, I can always get back. Well, I don't know what the latitude and longitude is where suddenly it's like, well, I actually am going to live here. I'm going to be here. And I'm not going back yeah. unless there's an emergency or a death or a wedding or, you know, something like that. So we picked Ecuador to begin so that we could learn what it was like to live in another country, so that we could get used to being out of the United States, so we could work out all the bugs of how money gets transferred, how you do your shopping, how you get what you need, mm -hmm. who will ship here. I mean, Amazon does not ship to Ecuador. You have to go through Correos, Ecuador. Right. Well, and then the president puts a $46 a tax to keep people shopping in Ecuador. So you, things change, things evolve. So getting packages here or cards, I can get a card, no problem, but I can't easily get a package here sometimes they're stopped at the customs and they for reasons that they don't ever explain they don't pass and they yep. go back yeah um so there are things like that that are kind of a pain but i live in a beautiful space with a view of the ocean right behind my view here uh, I am, can walk on the beach anytime I like. Those were things that were important to us, a place to get really good exercise, um, a place to eat well, sleep well, um, you know, be able to decompress from the machine of, you know, living in the United States. Yeah. So I think it takes about a year before you kind of get your footing. So pick the place that best serves as many of those things as are on your list. And then once you're there, you can reevaluate. How important is getting a box? How many people send me boxes? Well, not too many, actually. I can get the protein powder I want now. Oh, well, great. You know, <laughs> right. is that a problem now? As long as I don't bring clothes in, I won't get hit with that $46 tax. You learn to work around those things that don't work. Sure. As far as the mosquitoes go, oh well. I don't go out as much at night after 5.30 when the sun goes down. It's usually down by 6. And I don't have a big nightlife. So <laughs> right. Sure. Okay? Okay. I'm fine with that. I can get Netflix. I watch a movie. So you get to a place. You learn how to live there. You learn how to function. You learn how to do the basics of banking and living and eating and sleeping and all those things where you live. Mm -hmm. And... Uh -huh then you evaluate from there what are the things you can't live without that are still sitting on your list that you don't have now and are they deal breakers or could you live say us in Ecuador and could we get a break and go for three months six months of a year in another place get all that European coffee shop fountain you know stuff. cobblestone right. stuff beautiful you know gorgeous architecture and feed that part of ourselves for that period of time. That's a little more along the lines of your nomadic thing where you have a base mm -hmm. and then you go out from that base. And if that base is affordable enough, you can afford to do both. Right. If you end up in a place that's just prohibitive and you're maxed out in terms of money, that becomes a different challenge. Sure. So... You know, all these things come into play. Like, the short answer is make a list of all the things you really want and find a country that most approximates those as many of those as you can get and then go on from there. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's that's really good advice. And the other thing, too, that you're basically kind of nodding at there, too, is to keep your expenses as low as possible 
and also don't make it permanent so that way you've got more flexibility if you want to try somewhere else you can do it if you want to go back to the states you can do it but just yeah. give it a try and just go for well, it well the other thing i would say is i don't have a problem now renting i used to like own my own house in this the united states and i felt very that was important to me to have my space and to own my own place and all that and then you learn through the way the American medical system works, well, you get cancer and you become one of those statistics and there goes your house. Right. So right. you learn to live without it um, and you adjust as you go. I think as an expat, you're better served to rent rather than go somewhere and buy because then you really are stuck. You're committed right. Right. and you don't have the flexibility that I have right now where I could say, you know, I'm done with Ecuador. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to leave. Well, great. All I need is to put my stuff in a container and off I go to the next country. Yep. If I was, if I owned something, I would have to sell it. I'd have to get the price that I need in order to go to the next thing. And so I would make your money work for you. Don't live in sure. your asset. Right. Make your money work for you so that you can fund these other trips you want to take to see the world. And and become a world citizen in, instead of an expat, perhaps. That's a great that's that's great advice, and I really appreciate that. So, um, you know, I know we got to wrap things up here, and I just wanted to take an extra moment just to thank you so much for your time today, and and just everything that you've contributed. I I really appreciate it. Where uh, where can people find out more about your services, your books? What what's the best place for people to find out more if they're interested in what you do? Well, probably the easiest place to find me is MarianneDorward.com. So I don't know if you'll have that up there laying on some card for them, but it's M-A-R-Y-A-N-N-E-D as in David, O-R-W-A-R-D.com. And that will help you find me as far as speaking services or writing services or coaching services or uh, find my book and where to buy it. It's called Words to Thrive By. Powerful Stories of Courage and Hope, and it's on Amazon, and soon uh, we'll have one in the travel series, Words to Thrive By for Travelers, and that's where I'll be doing uh, my book on Ecuador, and uh, there is a blog you can go to called footprintsinecuador.wordpress.com, and that is where you can read about some of my reflections so far on the journey here in Ecuador this past year. Great. Well, that is awesome. Thank you so much. And I hope uh, maybe you could come back and speak to us again when your book comes out. I think sure, that would be great. That's yeah. a lovely invitation. Thank you very much. I really appreciate what you're doing and how you're really trying to make the expat experience real for people and give them the resources and the the information that they need in order to make the best decision for them. And I think that's why this program is so, so valuable and so enriching for anyone who wants to consider the possibility of living in another country. I just think it's great and oh. I appreciate what you're doing as well. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Thank you so much.